tell the truth with Dr. Rima. It's all about truth, isn't it? I'm Rima Ilego, MD. I am the medical director of the Natural Solutions Foundation, the largest health freedom organization in the world. Uh, our principal website is www.drrima.truthreports.com. Dr. Rima Truthreports dot com. Go there, sign up for the free newsletter. You need the information and we need your voice. With me today, I have enormous pleasure in introducing you to first my co-trustee and the co-host of our two-hour radio show called, not surprisingly, the Dr. Rima Truth Reports. Uh, we'll tell you when and where you can listen to that and how to get the archives of that very, very informative show. Ralph Fusatola, J.D., who is the counsel to the Natural Solutions Foundation and a true health freedom hero who uses his legal skills and um, uh, cleverness to um, help keep us free. And it's a huge battle, which we only win when all of us work together. Welcome, Ralph. Thank you, Dr. Rima, for having me on, I guess, the inaugural uh, episode of your new Saturday show. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Um, you and I have a long history of, of working together in live radio and in lots of other ways. Yep. Let me get right to our guests. We have Joe Jessen, who is um, a specialist in measurement. He measures things. He meters things. He figures out how to determine um, how much of things we have and whether we should have more or less of them, including, very, very importantly for today's discussion, radiation. Hello, Joe. Are you with us, Joe Jessen? I think Joe may have muted his microphone. Hello, Joe. Hmm. I hope he's there. Uh, well, while we're... It says they were, get... it, yes, the computer's trying to get him back. Yes, good. While we are trying to get Joe Jessen back, let me introduce you to Professor Tony Piera, who is a professor of environmental sciences at the University of Texas, Beaumont. And unlike uh, some people who write about and care about sustainability as a code word for depopulation, depopulation and enslavement, uh, Dr. Tony is actually one of the good guys. He's on our side, believing that there is enough earth, there is enough energy, there is enough water, there is enough air for us all if we manage the earth and our participation in the biosphere well. Welcome, Tony. Thank you very much, uh, the, Dr. Rimmer. Um, the um, uh, uh, small correction in there, I, uh, the, my assignment with uh, the, that university in Beaumont has uh, finished. Uh, but I have good news. I'm a Fulbright scholar, which is quite oh, a Oh, fantastic. Congratulations, Congratulations indeed. And, uh, it's, uh, thank you very much. It's, um, it's a merit-based, it's competition-based, and uh, he has um, had scholars and uh, notable men. He has the most Nobel Prizes in the world, about 50 of any organization. And it was, um, it has had... Um, Notable man, uh, President Carter was uh, was among them. Uh, Mandela, President Mandela was was a Fulbright scholar. It's a bilateral uh, treaty uh, uh, contract between two nations. About 150 nations uh, on the planet. About three quarters of all the nations on the planet have bi bilateral agreements with us, with the United States, and it was a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant idea of a senator, Senator Fulbright, just mm -hmm. after the war, that I, that he said, he, he thought to himself, and uh, uh, spoke out loud in the, in the Senate, uh, well, we have all of this equipment, the war now is finished, and we have all of this uh, equipment uh, that is surplus now because we don't have a war anymore. We're going to do with it. And uh, he proposed that to sell that equipment in order to finance and uh, education and bilateral agreements with other nations to 
foster and further science and uh, education and the political uh, study and uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Tony, nations. Dr. Tony, and what will you, congratulations, what will you be doing and where will you be doing it during your tenure as a Fulbright Scholar? I'll be doing research with the university in, uh, in Europe, uh, one of the oldest universities in Europe that is about 900 years old, so it's much, much older than our country and which, which any other country. It's a university in Italy. Which one? Uh, it's it's the University of uh, Palermo. Oh, how lovely. How it's lovely. wonderful. Well, that's not exactly uh, do, hardship. Do you, know, do you know that uh, do you know that university? It's one of the... There were, uh, the Italians formed the very first universities uh, in, in the, in the, in the Middle Ages, really. Um, well, I'm hoping, by the way, to get Joe Jessen back. I've called him back several times. We're having a little bit of a connection problem, uh, so I'm hoping he'll join us. Let us, uh, let us talk a bit about um, sustainability and about nuclear power and nuclear uh, leakage into the environment. Uh, you you focus on sustainability and sustainable energy. Um, you you focus very heavily on solar um, energy solutions. Um, you let me let me let people know first of all that I have just published a new uh, very important report uh, within the last couple of days on the fact that the EPA has been hiding the true situation in terms of the radiation levels that people in the United States are experiencing. And we'll talk in detail about precisely how they've been hiding it and what they've been hiding. But the, uh, the background, and Ralph, maybe before we go ahead, maybe you can give people the link that they can go to so they can get this new very, very important report. Absolutely. It is one of those tiny URLs that we use to point to our, our web form action pages. And this one is, uh, of course, HTTP colon double slash tinyurl.com forward slash Fukushima fire. That's tinyurl.com forward slash Fukushima, Fukushima fire. Now, there are two ebooks available there, one by the president of our foundation, General Burt. It's a, uh, an update of the recent situation in Fukushima. And then my new report, which talks about the fact that we now have graphic proof that the EPA has been lying through its teeth and altering the data to convince us that there is no harm to human health from radiation, when in fact, we have all, or almost all of us in the United States, been exposed for at least the past four years, that takes us a year before Fukushima, to levels of radiation so great that most cities in the United States are well above the internationally agreed upon radiation evacuation level. Now, I, I asked Dr. Tony to talk to us about um, uh, nuclear power and radiation contamination, and then I kept on talking, so I'll stop. <laughs> Dr. Tony, please go ahead. Uh, well, the um, it's it's uh, since um, the first atomic uh, explosion, uh, we have conducted. Um, I forgot the number, but I saw I saw the number several times. Uh, was it hundreds and or thousands? Maybe, indeed, thousands. Yeah. Uh, now, there's a wonderful uh, just, video on YouTube. Just, thank you, Ralph. Yeah. Not just in in our in our country, but uh, around the world. The Soviets, the, the former Soviet Union, uh, did that, and then several other countries that uh, France and uh, the UK. I think they exploited a few as well. Um, and that has released enormous amounts of uh, not just radiation, but radionuclides that most of them are 
do not exist in the natural state in the world, but they exist um, because they were fabricated during the uh, explosion of the uh, nuclear bomb, but, uh, during the nuclear blast. And some of those bombs were really big indeed, uh, uh, tens, uh, dozens of times more powerful than what it was exploded in, in Fukushima. In, the, in the Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and uh, just just before the end of the war, um, here, here our explosions were done first in the air in the Nevada and Arizona, and then uh, they were subterranean, and then done in the in the atolls in the Pacific, in the small islands of the Pacific, just obliterating them. Then somebody, someone came in and said, well, let's use the atom for peace and to, to generate energy. And there was the, this line that was circulated that atomic energy will be so cheap that it won't, we won't be able to meter it. So right. less than a cent for, for a kilowatt hour, even less than that. And that immediately the American public and the rest of the world was sold on that idea that we would have enough energy to power our society for forever. In, um, back in the early 2000s, uh, I had I, um, uh, advised a colleague at, at UCLA to, well, I had already uh, organized some of the well, the very first, the very first Earth Day in, in my department in 40 years, nobody has ever has, has done it. And then the colleague organized the Earth Day uh, lecture in uh, Earth Sciences in their, in their department. And asked me for who, who she had a little money and who should she uh, invite to come for a talk. And I've mentioned Dr. David Goodstein from Caltech which was the provost at the time, and also the um, professor of physics, a uh, distinguished professor of physics. So uh, he gave a talk, and he wrote the calculations. He did the calculations that if we were going to power all of our civilization, uh, with nuclear energy, we would need about 20,000 reactors. Well, we have about 400 right now and took all this time and materials to build them. So to build from 400 to 20,000 is a 50 times 50 fold increase. Right. Uh, in materials, in planning, in uh, political uh, and uh, economical uh, dealings and going back and forth and the industrial uh, the, the, uh, vamp up and, and revamp. So quite an enormous challenge. But this, that there is more to the story because if we were going to use, suppose we could, we could build them instantly, which is in, impossible to do. These uh, these commissions are large in in terms of metals, uh, steel, and uh, uh, cement, and concrete, and and uh, all of that uses uh, st more steel. Uh, so in order to meet those requirements, um, and of course uranium. Now uranium needs to be mined, needs to be refined, needs to be transported. Uh, then it needs to be installed on the reactor. So I, I hope that's Joe Jessen calls Ralph. I'm, I'm on. Oh, Where's you it? are. Oh, excellent. Uh, thank you. I'm so sorry we lost you, but folks, we've got Joe Jessen. Uh, Dr. Tony was just talking about some of the history of uh, nuclear uh, nuclear reasoning, if you can call it that. Um, so please go ahead, Dr. Tony. I'll, I'll finish and give anybody else the opportunity to, to speak as well. Uh, the, um, the amount of uranium 
the the most the most uh, that we can get in the best sites about one percent per ton, so uh, very 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 small amounts, uh, one gram per ton. Um, the uh, the um, if we were going to build twenty thousand reactors instantly in order to provide all the energy that we currently need, not, not even taking account to the needs of the future and the growth of the of society, then we would deplete all of the reserves, uranium reserves around the world, not just our country, around the world in a decade, the most two decades, but not, not, not longer than that. So that's the, the lie that we have been told that uh, in addition, there are uh, the the problems that we have seen, not just one time, not just two times, but now three times with Fukushima, that reactors are safe. They're not. I'm an engineer. I know materials and engineering very, very, very well. I, I teach those. And once materials are subject to pressure, temperature, stress, and forces, and in addition, they are sub, sub, subject to neutron bombardment and nuclear uh, exposure, then we have five, at least five variables in there that are the, the first four we understand very well. When radiation comes into account, then it becomes uh, at those pressures and temperatures, it becomes very, very difficult to deal with. In addition, building four reactors, six reactions right, right next to right to each other, as it is the case in Fukushima, and this is in the case in almost every single nuclear plant in the world, is the dumbest thing that any engineer could do, because if one breaks, then there is no way, no way that the, 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 to get to the other reactors, and they become immediately exposed, even if, if nothing happens to them. Uh, because the radiation levels are so big that just very, very short exposures like in Chernobyl that they were allowed to go for 60 seconds. And most of the, those poor guys, they died uh, in the first attempts to, to cover the reactor with, with uh, bags of sand. So this is uh, the lunacy and the insanity that we are all, all of the population is exposed to. Now, let me, let me make it clear, and we have two engineers uh, on the show, Joe Jessen and Professor Tony Piera, now a Fulbright Scholar. Very, very exciting. Let me make it clear that... It's, uh, it's when, easier to remember, I don't mean to interrupt you. It's easier to pronounce Dr. Tony. So Dr. That, Tony. Yeah. Uh, let, me, let me make it clear that to this day, there is still no safe, effective, efficient, and permanent disposal process for nuclear waste. Let me make it clear that the most advanced nuclear waste disposal facilities are very fragile. For instance, the WIPP um, disposal facility or uh, internment facility in New Mexico um, had casts of plutonium-enriched uh, nuclear waste from Los Alamos nuclear facility, and uh, they're stored in barrels which are damped, which are topped with, I kid you not, kitty litter. And the kitty litter um, has uh, materials in the clay that quenches some of the radiation. However, some idiot decided that organic kitty litter would be better and put in non-clay kitty litter, and those barrels are now burning and exploding, and the amount of plutonium uh, and other uh, radionuclides being released is unknown and incalculable right in the United States. There you have a Fukushima in the United States, but of course the press is currently ignoring. And in a moment, I'm going to ask uh, Joe Jessen to talk to us about measuring radiation, and then we'll tell you about the fact that we have discovered, the, the proof, that if you live in one of the 
large population centers of the United States, or a great many of the small ones, you probably are living in an area that is so heavily contaminated that you are well above the EPA's evacuation level and have been for years. Joe, uh, welcome back to the show. We were having some, some Skype difficulties, but we've got you now, and I'm very excited about that to have you. Um, talk to us about measuring radiation and what, uh, what happens when, when you try to measure radiation with the wrong Geiger counter, what is gamma, what is alpha, what is beta, uh, yeah, what are neutrons, and, and what are we looking at here? So thanks, thanks, Dr. Rima, for inviting me. Uh, I've got some interesting uh, news today also. Um, the, but measurement, I'm going to back up a little bit because I would like to get everyone to understand why measuring as, as uh, citizens, why we want to measure uh, radiation and why this is important to keep, keep an eye on the government numbers and the publicized numbers because, and, and I know you'll go into details about the findings, but um, leading up to uh, leading up to the discussion and the partial test ban treaty of 1963, uh, you know, you've seen a mass, massive amount of, of test explosions, nuclear test explosions, where, where, you know, they've unleashed 50, 58 megatons of the SAR bomb out of Russia, and uh, 54 was across, of course, the Bikini Atoll, 15 megaton explosion. So if you want to measure, why measuring is so important is, if you look at a chart of carbon-14, and carbon-14 basically is taken up into the cells via photosynthesis and makes its way up through the food chain, basically. And it um, enters animal cells through the DNA through mitosis. But the, the point is, is if you look at a graph, if you just graph uh, carbon-14 level, just the ambient carbon-14 level, you see an incredible spike. It comes, comes out at a very low level in 1955. But when the pressure is on to, to, to ban uh, above ground nuclear weapons and every government you see russia you see usa people that had the bombs basically were in a were in a mad rush just to launch their their 50 megaton bomb so you see a spike you see a huge spike mm. over on c4 uh, carbon 14 in about 1963 when they actually implemented the the uh, uh, partial test ban treaty and after that you see a decrease and then, then comes Chernobyl, and one, one important fact people should know about Chernobyl, this was not told to us by the Russian government. I mean, this was, this was discovered by scientists um, outside of Russia when they looked at the ambient level of radiation and said, wait a minute, something is really wrong here. We see a dramatic spike in uh, carbon-14 and other, other uh, cesium products. Uh, so we... We, we had a problem, basically, and the Finnish scientists were the ones, I believe, that first identified the uh, Chernobyl event. But throughout at all the events, and then initially in Fukushima, you see a, an overt attempt, basically, by the government to cover up the actual impact of the explosion. And so this is what got my attention. I mean, it's, it's well documented that uh, Fukushima was the government completely covered up the the magnitude of the event and the actual measuring of the the uh, background radiation and the ongoing uh continuous leakage of radiation into the ocean um so these numbers were covered up but the good news is that you had quite a few citizen scientists that built their own radiation measurement equipment and they put it on a uh they they sent the data to a international portal based in London called Patch Bay, now called Lively. Uh, but so you have you have multiple sensors that the the citizen scientists themselves are sending um, radiation sensing data and they're using simple radiation instruments uh, like the Geiger counter, the GM to approach. Um, so basically that kind of leads into what 
what my interest is, and that is to really to really understand the effects and the origin of the radiation spikes that we're seeing in this in this country and around the world, uh, because we're not going to learn it through governments. And in fact, let me just say briefly before I, I give the floor back to Dr. Rima. Um, whenever there's an incident in this country, in the U.S., there's a secret team called NEST that they fly together, they meet, and then they go investigate any any documented or any rumors of an incident. There's a team called NEST that fly in and get together and go on location with instruments known as isotope detection equipment or scintillation detectors. So what they come in with is, and um, <clears throat> so for example, if Homeland Security sees a potential incident coming in, and you know, this, the New York and all the ports now have, have radiation sensors um, tied, gamma radiation sensors tied to the uh, tugboats and the ports and also the uh, tunnels feeding Manhattan, for example, there's radiation sensors. So, but they're very crude. All I can tell you is that initially that uh, they're sensing a high burst of gamma. So they know there's a gamma emitter, but they don't know what the, what the root cause is, is. What is the actual isotope that's, that's, a, that's the emitter of radiation? So what they do right now, Homeland for, uh, Security, for example, has some very expensive sensors that they bring in whenever there's a peak of gamma. Uh, called a scintillation detector, and then that actually identifies the isotope. And um, so to make a long story short, uh, when NEST gets involved, they don't publicize their results, they don't publicize when they get together, and there, there's no information on why, what is the trigger that pulls NEST together to go on site to investigate a, a potential incident. Um, I'll give the floor back to Dr. Rima. Well, this is most important. What, first of all, what you're saying is that if there is a radio uh, a nuclide leak, if there is a danger to human health, the government will investigate and the government will keep the results secret. And this Correct. is of enormous importance to you. If you are still of the delusional belief that you can trust the uh, the government, and this could be the U.S. government, it could be the Japanese government, any government, to tell you the truth about a nuclear event and tell you whether or not there is, in fact, a harm to human health involved. Well, you need your meds adjusted because you're delusional. Uh, governments are incredibly closely tied to the nuclear industry, and the nuclear industry needs you to believe that there is no harm to human health and that nuclear power, nuclear reactors, nuclear bombs, nuclear subs, etc., are safe and we should just rely on the pronouncements of the official uh, persons who tell us they're safe. And this is quite literally delusional. So, Joe is saying, if you have a Geiger counter, it may not be this fancy dancing scintillation counter thing, but you will see the general trend. Indeed, Dr. Rima, I am uh, turning on my Geiger counter right now, uh, the one that we've uh, been using for the past several years, and I'll let you know what the reading is in a couple of moments. Excellent. Um, I have, by the way, I'll get to this in a moment, uh, the Natural Solutions Foundation had a very... Um, very sophisticated Geiger counter donated to it by FLIR. Uh, it's called an identifinder, and it will identify specific radioisotopes, which is quite wonderful. Um, but you don't have to have an $18,000 um, Geiger counter donated to you or purchased. A simple Geiger counter will give you information that will show you a trend, and Joe is talking about why you need it. The reason that you need it is you cannot believe the U.S. government, the Japanese government, or any other government because their nuclear industry is controlled by, I'm, I'm sorry, their nuclear regulation is controlled by the nuclear industry in the same way that our food industry is controlled 
the regulation is, con I'm sorry, our food regulation is controlled by the food industry, our drug regulation is controlled by the drug industry. Now, having said that, do we face a nuclear problem? Well, at this point, let's go to the report, the special report that the Natural Solutions Foundation has just put out. Um, in that report, we talk about the fact that the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, has a level at which they say the population should be evacuated because the radiation hazard is too great for people to stay where they are. And that level is pretty much the internationally agreed upon level, which is way too high, by the way. That level is 20 thousandths of a sievert per year, or 20 millisieverts per year. Now, you don't have to know what a sievert is and how it's derived and how it relates to other um, measurement systems to understand that that number translates to about 272 or 273 counts per minute of a radiation detector that's using cesium-137 as its uh, source. Don't worry about that part. Just remember the number 272 counts per minute. Now, if the, the detectors are picking up more than 272 counts per minute, according to the EPA's latest document on this subject, that's the point at which a population needs to be evacuated. That means you should leave your home and maybe you'll come back to your home someday, but probably not. That's a pretty serious situation. And it means that the nuclear contamination is absolutely out of control. So are, are there any places in the United States where the EPA, which claimed for several years following Fukushima not to be monitoring radiation, not to be monitoring food, not to be monitoring water, not to be monitoring um, uh, other uh, uh, ambient uh, radiation in the air. And of course, they hadn't turned off their detectors at all. They just weren't making the, the data particularly public. Turns out when you find those data, uh, and they have been monitoring it, many cities in the United States are actually above the evacuation level. And they have been above the evacuation level for, are you ready for this? Not just since Fukushima, but for at least four years, because the data set that I found shows data for the last four years. And during that time, Hartford, Connecticut, for example, has been well above 272. Um, uh, Fresno, California, well above. 272. Miami, Florida has been above 400 for that entire period and is rising steadily. Uh, this is gamma radiation that we're talking about for those of you who want the, uh, that specific information. And that's bad enough. That's pretty bad as uh, Dr. Tony will tell us, as Joe will tell us, as I will tell you as a physician. This is not healthy. This We're talking about increases in cancer. We're talking about increases in infertility and sterility, uh, increases in birth defects, increases in heart disease. This is, this is bad news. Well, it gets worse. The EPA also measures, it turns out, not surprisingly, other types of radiation. Remember, we said there was alpha, there was beta, and there was gamma radiation. That we're talking about. We're not talking about uh, uh, other other classes of uh, measurement right now. Just alpha, beta, gamma, that'll do fine. Now, beta is associated very specifically, beta radiation, with increased cancer. Gamma radiation is associated with diabetes and uh, many other things as well, but the principal health effect that beta has is primarily an increase in cancer of various tissues depending on where the, the um, 
the item that is emitting the beta settles. Okay, so we're talking about an increase in cancer, and we all know about the tremendous increase in cancer rates in the United States uh, that's been going on for quite some time. Well, turns out that in those cities, and I've made these the charts that refer that show this data available in this special report in those cities in which uh, the evacuation level of 272 has been surpassed for most or all of the last four years in those areas in those cities the beta data the chart showing the beta have a flat line surrounding the time of Fukushima. In those cities where the, uh, the evacuation levels have not been surpassed, the beta data show the data from about December 2010 to about February 2012. Now, you will recall that Fukushima took place on March 11th, 2011. So for about 15 months before, during, and after the Fukushima, uh, the first Fukushima crisis, because there have been continuing crises, during that time, amazingly enough, the data, the beta data for cities that should be uh, under evacuation, the beta data is absent totally and completely flatline, gone, absent. But for those cities where the beta data, uh, where the city has not reached evacuation levels, the beta data is completely intact. Now that's extraordinary. What that says is that not only is it okay for the EPA and the other um, nuclear and, and uh, uh, regulatory agencies to lie to you, not only is that okay, but they think that you are incredibly stupid, that you won't notice, A, the dropout of data, and B, the fact that there's a pattern to the dropout of data. Well, you're not that stupid, and neither am I, and we noticed it very clearly this week, I checked with these two gentlemen who are on our show, Joe Jessen and Professor Tony Piera, and I said, am I getting something wrong here? Is this possible? This is horrendous. And then when they said, no, you're doing the calculations right, and this does seem to be the situation, then the Natural Solutions Foundation went public with this data. So that's the background. To recap, because it might be a little bit difficult to follow, and Ralph will give the the link. The, the data on beta emissions, beta contamination and exposure that's linked with cancer, for those cities that have been above the evacuation level set by the EPA for the last four years, that Fukushima data is missing. For those cities that are not above the evacuation level, the data is intact. Very Dramatic. Ralph, would you give the, the link where people can get this, uh, this special report? And by the way, it is free. This is a public service. Yes, Dr. Rita. It's one of our tiny URLs, tinyurl.com forward slash Fukushima fire. That's Fukushima fire, one, one on, run on word, tinyurl.com forward slash Fukushima fire. Now, Dr. Rima, I've had uh, my, uh, my Geiger counter on, and let's see what type of reading we get here. Um, I've got an average of 0 0.110 microsieverts per hour. Now, uh, it was peaking up as high as uh, the maximum was uh, 170 that I saw. Uh, and so uh, then this is point, point 0.110, one, you know, a little over a tenth of a micro siever. And now, I'm going to get out my calculator. Good. And let me and let me and while you're getting your calculator out, I'm going to quickly uh, recap the readings I've had over the past several years because we obtained the 
uh, Geiger counters a couple of months after the Fukushima event. <clears throat> and uh, we noticed, Dr. Rima had one in, in the Deep South in Chile. I had one up here in New Jersey. And uh, the readings in the Deep South were about 0 .04, four one hundredths of a millisievert. And the readings up here in New Jersey were about 0 .9, 0 .09 rather, uh, millisieverts. So uh, we were, we were uh, about twice as hot, a little more than twice as hot as the Deep South at that point. Over the past two years, I've watched the average slowly working its way up. As I said, it's now at 0 0.110 on this particular day. Um, during the heavy snowstorms of this winter, the readings were a bit higher. And we actually, on one of uh, the Dr. Rima Truth Report programs, we, uh, we worked on those, uh, we, on those uh, issues and, and looked at a reading of inside this room versus a reading of on top of the snowbank. And it was actually hotter out in the snow. And we've also noticed that the whole house filter, the HEPA filter on the fan, whole house fan, will read much higher than the background. But it's been slowly going up and a 20% increase since the time of Fukushima. But there was an initial, an initial increase. We have to assume that the north and the south were approximately equal in radiation levels by the time of Fukushima, because it had been decades since the uh, last nuclear tests. Those nuclear tests are scattered around the world. There's an amazing uh, YouTube video where someone took 50 years of nuclear testing and put it on a map over five minutes. You get a beep and a little point of light, and it gets faster and more intense in several waves, as Dr. Tony uh, described. And, uh, and it, uh, it's an astounding video. You really get the feeling of what's been done. Nuclear testing was a form of geoengineering. The existence of nuclear power plants, um, especially those that are along uh, rivers and fault lines is in a, in, and coasts, is a type of geoengineering. And, uh, and so that's what we're seeing. We, we've seen this, this gradual increase. Now, this is just one Geiger counter in one room in Northwest New Jersey. These networks that we've been talking about, the one network, netc.com, is where some of these readings are from. There are other networks. There's the radiation uh, uh, network uh, that uh, the company that, uh, that sells some of the Geiger counters has. Voluntary networks on the internet. And that, I think, is a powerful people power response. People power response. Now, once you had your measurement, what do you do with it? You know that there is no such thing as a safe dose of radiation. There is no safe dose of radiation. You know that radiation is being dumped into your environment willy-nilly. And you know that this is not good for you, not good for your children, not good for your future. So now, what do you do about this? What are your options? First of all, there are the per personal protection options. But there's also the political policy, the social policy options. This has to stop because we are all going to be contaminated out of existence. Gentlemen, I would like to ask Joe Jessen, who is very much aware of citizen monitoring, and our Tony Piera, Dr. Tony, to talk to us about uh, what they see our options as. Joe, you want to go ahead? Joe, why don't you start? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I, in terms of options, I look at this as a, uh, you know, a reproducible um, experiment. I would really like to to dig in and look at, you know, look at the root causes of and what isotopes are we actually seeing. And uh, now let me just explain one thing, and it gives you a general idea of how, how the pros do this is so at the ports for example a port in new york and ports at la when the containers come through they're they're they go through a pass a single pass test of the gamma level so if they note a high peak in gamma readings what they'll do is then they'll take a look at the bill of lading on the uh, shipping container and then the so this confirms whether this is a natural source of um of a uh, gamma emitter 
And if it's, for example, tabletops, if it's granite, granite tops, what they do is they assume there's a high level of natural radiation off of granite tops. I mean, if you look at most imported um, granite tops, you'll see a high, a, a very high ambient emitter, gamma emitter. Now, and they'll let it pass at that point. But what if they see a high gamma source coming from it, and they can't, they can't work through the uh, in the what they do no, at the actual up. isotopes, and and they'll use a calibrated um, scintil, uh, scintillation detector, as I mentioned earlier, and actually look at the energy level, and they'll correlate it from the energy level back to the actual isotope. And this is all done with a calibrated instrument. So this is a way. This is a way of really. Then they start ratcheting, ratcheting up their concern when they can see that this is a, uh, uh, let's say, so a primary primary elements to make a dirty bomb, for example. Um, so, but this is a way of filtering out some of the ambient radiation with with uh, some very concerned um, isotopes. Can we assume, Joe, yeah. that can we assume, yeah. Joe, that the readings that the EPA was posting on its uh, beta site were of, of that quality? Um, I certainly, I suspect the readings I'm getting with my little uh, handheld device are probably not of that quality. But we, can we assume that the hue, the very high readings that the EPA was was getting is getting um, are no. therefore no. accurate? What, what, what the, yeah. Well, you know, be, being the most transparent government ever. <laughs> uh, <laughs> We, we know, for example, those readings are not of that quality. Um, the example I cited was really uh, done and limited in secret to our ports. So this is done locally in the ports when the, when the containers come in to the ports. But the sites that, that we're, you're referring to are, are, they don't look like, I went in and looked at the notes. They don't appear to be calibrated. They don't appear to be on an isotope level of, of discrimination. So, you know, they seem like, and then, of course, as Dr. Rima is going to talk about, we don't, we, we can't see consistency from reading to reading from day to day or even in retroactively. So um, I guess my answer is no, I don't, I don't trust the government in any way, shape or form for this. Now, if we can assume that, uh, just bear with me for a moment on this, if we assume that, uh, a city like Miami, Florida, where the gamma readings have been above 400. Remember, the, the uh, EPA evacuation level is 272 or 273. Uh, if we assume that a city like Miami, which has had readings above 400 for four years, and those readings are steadily rising, and if you go to uh, tinyurl.com, Fukushima, uh, tinyurl.com forward slash Fukushima fire. Uh, you'll be able to download this and see these graphs for yourself. Uh, we assume that these are meaningful numbers. We have a city close to a nuclear reactor called Turkey Point, which has been steadily accumulating more and more gamma radiation, but which has already been uh, clearly above the evacuation level for the entire four years for which we have data. So what do we do then? What do people do if they start monitoring? They have big monitors now, and, and they say, oh, my God, we're at 416 counts per minute, and the evacuation level of the EPA is 272. What then? Indeed. Well, I mean, what... What I would do would we, you know, I would push to, to have our readers uh, support and work with us and, and develop a, uh, an independent network that we could, we could have some reliability and accurate readings that would be traceable and calibrated sensors. Uh, so we have something to really hang our hat on, and uh, we could have this as a private network that would... Um, be able to look at, um, you know, the two different coasts in the Midwest, let's say, three or four sampling points. And um, and then we would have a, let's say, every three months, we'd have a, a procedure where we would calibrate the, um, 
the sensors. Wow. So we would have we would have uh, a known accurate uh, reading. We would have something that the government is not giving us today. Now, having said that, the government internally, of course, has all this, and, and, but it's not something that they're sharing with us. Right. Exactly. And, you know, um, we began this process a number of months ago when we created the International Commission to study and finalize environmental remediation, IC SAFER. And uh, Ambassador Morata, the gentleman uh, Morata-san from Japan, who is known as the conscience of Fukushima, and uh, Professor Busby from the European uh, uh, Watchdog Agency, uh, Radiation Watchdog Agency, and uh, our General Burt uh, agreed to be the organizing committee. Uh, I think you're probably right, Joe. It's time to, uh, to bring that, that whole concept forward uh, we've been talking about it, sending emails back and forth, and it's time to probably to to actually put together that network as a really powerful first step. Uh, it's uh, something we can do as private citizens to help alert the world to what's really happening. Yeah, you know, you know, and we have about four right minutes now. left, folks. About four minutes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, I want to make sure that we have a chance for uh, Dr. Tony uh, to give us final words along with Joe. Go ahead, Joe. Yeah, so one of the things I, I wanted to say, too, is uh, Reuters Stokes is a sensor company that supplies 95% of all nuclear power plants sensors. So they have the gamma, uh, beta, and alpha sensors that's incorporated for production use. And these are count. Cal- cal- calibrated every two to three months and the data is available but of course it's not available to the public so what i would argue for is we would have high quality uh, matrix so we could we could keep watch on what the government's trying to feed us excellent dr uh, tony very excellent that's yeah. really very important go ahead tony but dr tony tell us what your your final words are the uh, this is uh, uh quite an extremely complex and difficult problem and that we were forced at this time to live with uh, very difficult to solve once the Pandora box is open it's uh, practically impossible to put the, the atoms back into the genie and they stay in the environment for a very 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 long period of time that outlasts any one of us outlasts our civilization outlasts the life of the planet. Um, very small amounts of radiation are um, um, ca- cancer causing. I, all ionizing, pretty much all ionizing radiation, only very, very small levels, uh, are not cancer causing, but, but the vast majority of radiation is cancer causing. Um, that includes everything, particle, photon, uh, radiation uh, coming from atoms, um, from X-tubes, from X-ray tubes, from uh, radiographies, from X-rays, from CAT scans. CAT scans. Uh, and the body has a limited capability to deal with um, healing the damage that is done into the cells and eliminate the cancer cells, uh, less capability to deal with DNA mutations. Uh, so uh, just a, uh, the idea of what has been happening, and that, may inc- that it certainly includes radiation and nuclear energy, in the last, uh, in about just a century ago, uh, well, let's look at it the, the other way around. Today, the CDC in April 2010 issued a report that stroke, the good old stroke, no longer was the leading cause of death in the United States and that radiation was now, back then, 2010, radiation, the cancer was the, uh, the uh, leading cause of death. And that one in two Americans were expected to die of cancer. One in two. You should go check it out. Now, this is not to report. get cancer. This is to die of cancer. To die of cancer. Right. Now, 
and dying of cancer and cancer can originate from many many sources for many for many reasons we don't know except nobody really knows well exactly there is a theory however and it's a theory that dr rima has advanced uh, she calls it the uh, genome disruption syndrome uh, in fact you can learn more about that in the last few seconds perhaps of the show i should say this uh, at www.gds-therapy.com Genome disruption syndrome. Basically, what uh, Dr. Rima has been saying is that the these uh, these uh, neo geoengineering uh, technologies, nuclear power, the the toxins and the vaccines and drugs, the GMO uh, novel proteins, uh, and all that stuff disrupts the human genome, causes the cancer and the other chronic diseases. And then there's an answer to it, and the answer is that that our, our natural products industry for over a half century has really worked hard on creating antioxidants. And while they're not sufficient in the most extreme cases, uh, there are lots of great nutritional approaches to supporting optimal health in a no longer optimal world. And that's a tough thing to do necessarily, but uh, it is something that we can all pay attention to. Absolutely. Uh, we're just out of time here on tell, To Tell the Truth with Dr. Rima, and our guests have been Ralph Fusatola, J.D., uh, Joe Jessen, and Professor Tony Pierre, who has an awful lot to say, as do we all. Please go to Dr. Rima Truth Reports, D-R-R-I-M-A, truthreports.com, enter your name, become part of the information flow and the solution to the problems. Please join us next month on United We Strike Radio Marathon, and you can also join us at uh, Revolution Radio Studio B for the Dr. Rima Truth Reports. You'll find that out when you sign up for the, uh, uh, for the newsletter that you will get when you enter your email address and your first name at drrematruthreports.com. Uh, I, I cut Dr. P, Dr. Tony off. Uh, is there a burning word that needs to be said, Ralph? People, there's always more information. You need to stay tuned to this information.